Today, we're talking with Scott Goodson, the CEO and founder at Strawberry Frog and co-author of the book, Activate Brand Purpose, uh, how to harness the power of movements to transform your company. For more than 25 years, Scott's worked with companies like Google, like Emirates, like Heineken, Coca-Cola, and Mercedes. And he invented the concept, the concept of movement thinking, which is what we'll be talking about today. And just quickly, before you get started, make sure to go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you get the latest episodes as soon as they're released. Now let's get into it. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. Very nice to be here. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's fantastic to have you here. Um, let's let's jump straight in. You talk about brand purpose and uh, this concept um, that's called movement thinking. What do you mean by these kind of ideas? Well, it's very simple. Um, it's using the principles of social movements in order to activate a purpose so that people like employees as well as consumers really understand what you're trying to do and want to be part of driving that change. So it's connecting to kind of something that's already uh, happening in the world. Is that correct? And yeah, then me, kind of I mean, you can, yeah, yeah, you can have a, you can have a movement that is about driving a, you know, a form of positive change. It doesn't always have to be that way. You could certainly, have a movement of cultural engagement where people are participating in a, you know, mass participation in a, in a cultural idea that doesn't necessarily have to drive positive change. But more often than not, uh, it is about identifying something out there that is wrong that you want to write, uh, you know, or some monster out there that you need to defeat. So it is connecting to something, right? And I think the best example of this, I think that everyone is across is Patagonia, right? You know, that seems to be the poster child of, you know, it's what it means to be a purpose-driven company. Is that correct? Like, is that an example of a purpose-driven company? Absolutely. A company I like Patagonia? Very, yeah, I think it's a very good example. I think it's, you know, through the lens of sustainability and taking a stand against, you know, any political or or business decision that is jeopardizing the climate, that would be a perfect example. But I think there are a lot of other examples out there that are not necessarily connected to um, climate. Um, there are ideas about all sorts of things. Um, and in, in small ways and big ways, those ideas can drive positive change. For example, you know, a few years ago, uh, we did the... Um, we did a movement for Jim Bean, which I know is very popular in Australia. It comes in cans. People drink it at the beach. Um, and <laughs> it the comes movement, in bottles too. <laughs> and it comes in bottles too. Yeah. Uh, we did a movement against the patriarchy and for equality. And we had um, Mila Kunis as the first spokesperson for American whiskey. That was a pretty big move for equality. And the net result of that was women felt the brand respected them and validated them. And as a result, they rewarded the company. And today, a significant, I believe a majority of the consumers are under 45. And there's, you know, at least 40% of them are women. So, you know, companies that do drive positive change are typically rewarded, especially these days with young consumers, younger consumers. Okay. Um, let's just go into that, that example quickly. Um, how did they choose that? Like, in terms of their brand purpose, because it seems like that would be on, it feels like that that would be on the risky side because, you know, the gym beam, like the look and the feel is very masculine, you know, like let's like across the past 20, 30 to 50 years, like, like it has had quite a lot of like masculine kind imagery. of advertising and so on. Yeah. Like imagery, yeah. the concept. So it feels yeah. like taking that stance could have been pretty risky for them. So, you know, so what kind of considerations are happening like at the time that there's a purpose that is being selected? Well, in the case of Beam, the risky strategy would have do, to be to do nothing. I mean, because they're, you know, compared to Jack Daniels, which is more or less equivalent, you know, it's a American whiskey, corn-based whiskey, uh, one's a bourbon and one's a American whiskey in Tennessee. Um, and one could argue, you know, what's the big difference and so forth. But from a macro perspective, they're both American whiskeys. And Jim Beam was having their clock knocked by um, Jack Daniels. You know, Jack was $12.99 a bottle for the same liquid. And Jim was like $7.99 and two free shot glasses at the bottom shelf of 7-Eleven. So they were in really bad shape. The average age of their customer was in the late 60s, all male. 
And so, you know, when you're up against the wall, you've got to make some bold moves. And, you know, in today's world, we're living in a world of constant, you know, VUCA world, volatility and change. You know, you're faced with a lot of issues all the time. So I would say any move is a bold move. Doing nothing is a bold move. Doing nothing is probably the riskiest move. So uh, in that particular case, they had a real business um, objective, which was to grow the business and increase household penetration, raise the price. And to do that, you had to completely rethink who the consumer was. And all the research we did uh, here in the United States, in Germany, Australia, and the other core markets where Beam has been around for a long time, showed that there was a lot of room for growth among women. And that proved to be accurate. And you're not going to attract women with a very traditional male, you know, patriarchal message. So nothing better than to take a page out of any social movement, giving women a platform and using that as a movement for Beam. And then hiring this woman, Mila Kunis, uh, and, and having her as the poster child of that. And the result was, as I said, the business turned around. And today, actually, they're doing better than Jack Daniels. Okay, so the, the right kind of connection to the right kind of movement can have a, um, like a very positive impact like on the company's success, right? Um, right. How yeah. does a company start to think about the kind of um, the cause, the movement, um, the purpose that, that it should be connected to? Because it seems like, yeah. yes, it's definitely risky to not take action, but that's kind of – the known entity, right? To take action in a specific area um, feels like it would be very scary for lots of executives, right? And so how do you start thinking about, you know, so how do you connect the brand to some purpose? Well, I think, you know, so let, let's just define, get some definitions down first, if we can. Yes. So purpose is, you know, what is the higher order idea that you, your organization is working towards that is beyond dollars and cents? Like it's typically like, what's the soul of the organization? Why are you, why are you existing uh, more than making money? Um, and you'd be surprised at how many leaders out there actually are really passionate about climate, sustainability, mental health, um, financial well-being, like real issues that, do, you know, they come across through their employees or their customers or the communities within which they work. Those things are pretty normal. And I think today leaders realize they've got to, um, you know, they've got to be aware of these issues. And not everybody is able to activate it actually in a genuine way. But, you know, increasingly, I would say leaders are pretty good in that space. If you're if you are a leader and you're trying to turn a purpose into a movement, now a purpose is that higher higher order strategy. The problem with the purpose is it can typically be either toothless. In other words, it feels so opaque and you know just uh, like you know we want to drive some form of good for the world. Like I hear that more often than you. <laughs> You know, we're um, positive people. We're positive. We want to help. It's like yeah, a little help. bit more than that. <laughs> we're going yeah. to continue to make a million of these units a year, but we want to help. Um, anyway, um, movement is so when I started working with purpose back in the 90s, I lived in Sweden at the time. And um, as soon as we got out of the Nordics and we started to market outside uh, in Eastern Europe and Asia and even in Australia, where, you know, we we launched, for example, Ericsson mobile phones I was working on at the time, and IKEA was another company. We realized that purpose was just way too theoretical. It was like taking a university course, a uni course, as they say in Australia. Um, it's just so they don't say that elsewhere. It's not called like like. Is that just you don't an Australian say uni, thing? Like uni, university, or uh, no? In yeah. the US, you say college. We shorten everything here. Business, you know, different names. Yeah, uni. Yeah. And um, I love how everyone in Australia says like, uh, "You pay this." Will you buy this or your sunnies? Like <laughs> your sunnies. Yeah. Sunnies. Yeah, they're, they're called sw swimmers, not bathers. Swimmers. Bathers. Well, or or bathers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> bathers. Swimmers. Yeah. Um, so purpose is a bit theoretical and movement is about activating that purpose, like a social movement, any movement, you know, of like, you know, women's movement or, you know, the black lives matter movement, whatever movement you can 
immediately go to that's kind of what a movement is. So how do you take a strategy like a purpose, turn it into an activation plan that people just genuinely and intuitively feel like they're a part of it, they get it, they're emotionally connected, they're passionate advocates. Um, that's kind of what we're doing with this movement thinking. Um, but um, getting back to what you asked me to answer your question, you know, if you're a leader, you just really need to make sure you have a strong personal connection to the movement you're participating in or you're leading. And a movement usually as I said earlier, involves um, a wrong that needs to be righted in the world. So it needs to be something that you're super passionate about and that you have a personal affinity for. And, and also importantly, you can connect back to your organization in some way. Um, it could be something you mildly agree with, um, but you just got to be careful that it's not um, just – something that you stick on the organization. There, there was a company in the United States called Planters Peanuts. And recently they came out with a purpose, which some, was worth something about, um, you know, being uh, something about your energy, which made sense because, you know, nuts are protein and gives you energy to do great things. And then they did an ad where they talked about, um, about paying women the same as men. You know, and saying, like, if you don't pay women the same as men, it's nuts. And it just feels like an opportunistic ad that has nothing to do with peanuts. You know, it'd be like, I don't know if you have like, uh, like in Australia, it would be like, uh, pay women the same as men from Foster's beer. Like, what? Like, how does that have mm. anything to do mm. with Foster's beer? Mm. So you have to have some connection to the organization, to what they do, to what the leadership care about and, and demonstrate. Because the consumers are sitting there waiting for an organization to say they're going to do something and then do nothing and just, you know, have an ad. Hmm. So you've got to do something. You've got to activate. It seems that there's a whole industry here. It's called superannuation. It's like your 401k. But there's this whole thing um, in terms of um, the ethical Ah, superannuation companies that only like invest like in ethical kind of like companies and so on, right? And it's you know yeah. seen like some huge uptake in Australia through social media and you know just through connecting to you know what the audience actually you know um, are trying to change in the world, and they are voting uh, basically uh, with their superannuation dollars, right? That they have to put somewhere, right? Like in that seems to be like a whole industry that's been created um, through movements, right? Um, it's been so hard to differentiate between superannuation funds, you know, for quite a long time. And now this whole thing, I mean, in terms of well, this idea of ethical investing um, has opened up a whole area, right? But for most companies, they can't change their business model um, to create something that like is about the movement. And so they have to start to figure out, you know, so what are the things which I can connect with, right? So let's start by just quickly trying to pull it apart for a second so that the listeners can start to get the concept in terms of execution correct, right? So you've got the brand purpose, right? That's part one, and that then leads to movement thinking, right? So yeah. if I'm trying to figure out the brand purpose, who in the company needs to be bought into that? Because it feels like, the bigger the company, the more stakeholders, the more opinions, the more diverse the possible purposes could be, right? So, you know, so what's a way that companies can start thinking about, you know, trying to identify their brand purpose? Well, to answer the first part of that question, it has to be the very top. You know, it has to be the CEO. Uh, if the CEO is not bought in, if the CEO is not part of it, it's not going anywhere. Um, and these days, CEOs actually do want to be part of these conversations, and, uh, um, you know, sometimes other C-suite executives or board members want to be part of it as well. And, uh, you know, how do you go about finding it? Well, like I said, it has to be somewhat related to what you're doing. Um, so, for example, here in the United States, there's a very large financial institution, a bank called SunTrust, and they hired um, BCG, which is a big consulting company, to come up with their purpose. And I mean, there are a lot of companies out there that will do this for you. We do it as well, but honestly, it's not our expertise. Our expertise is in activating purpose. But in the case of SunTrust, 
they um, worked with BCG and they developed a purpose which was called lighting the way to financial well-being. Lighting the way to financial well-being. That was their purpose. And, you know, it's a bit of a mouthful. Hard to remember. Keep in mind that a lot of tellers and banks are high school yet, you know, high school educated. So what does this mean to me? What does it mean to my family? Lighting the way to financial well-being. It's a bit theoretical, perhaps. The good thing about it is it's uh, about the consumer. It's about the end user. It's about lighting their well-being. Um, it's about uh, steps towards helping them you know, achieve financial well-being. So there's a lot of good things in there, but but the phrase is a bit heavy, hard to remember, difficult to share in a peer-to-peer -peer world internally inside an organization. So we came up with a movement called On Up. And the On Up movement was against financial stress and for financial confidence. And we set out to help Americans find financial confidence. And we said, we are going to generate 5 million participants in this movement within five years. We ended up generating six and a half million in this movement in three years. So it was a huge success for a bank. I mean, can you imagine, mm. you know, a bank actually starting a social movement to drive some form of positive change in society. So it can actually happen. Um, and that, that should give you a good example of what I mean by a purpose it can be a little theoretical that then is activated with a purpose. That's oh, right. Okay. With yeah, with the movement. Okay, so uh, just for clarity, the purpose is the idea, right? The purpose is the idea of what we stand for, right? And there might be a few ideas which a company could stand for, right? The movement yeah. side of things, the movement thinking side of things, is then the actions which you're going to take to activate it. Is that right? Yep, correct. And it seems like... And this is just from what I've seen in the world, you know, so where a lot of companies fall down is they may come up with a brand purpose, but then the movement is not really, they don't really invest in it like it's a movement. They invest in it like it's a little campaign on the side, right? And it yeah. seems like for a company to really be a purpose-driven company, it needs to be part of the company, right? And so can you talk about quickly, you know, so, you know, so what does activation actually mean and how kind of integrated within the company um, should that activation actually be? It's got to be throughout the organization. I mean, you know, it's, we developed a tool called the Purpose Gap, which measures how well a purpose is activated in an organization from the very top the moment the C-suite launches it to rapturous applause to three years later, how well is it being used at the bottom of the organization? Um, and that's really what it is all about. Like if you're launching a purpose and you're activating in a way that engages people through actions and or communications, it should have a meaningful role in the organization 18 months later. And, you know, the main I guess the main way of thinking, the main framework of a movement is um, the difference between like top-down leadership, do this because I tell you to do it, and cross-company leadership, let's do this because we all want to do it, because it's something that really matters to all of us, all who work in this company. And that's really what it's about. Um, and you know, if you are launching a purpose inside your organization and you're measuring it over time and down through the organization and there is nothing happening, then you haven't really activated it well. It starts internally, right? Um, so the yeah. purpose always starts inside, right? And right. then yeah. it expands outside. This is something which you speak about like, in your book, right? And so, you know, what's the, what's like the rollout like of an activation, right? Cool. So we figure out the purpose, we identify the movement, you know, so what are like, not all the steps, but some of like the key steps involved in, you know, to roll this out effectively? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, in the book, Activate Brand Purpose, that's really what we talk about. Um, the basic premise of this is a brand or company can identify and crystallize a mass movement. You know, that's the basic idea. And we've got plenty, you know, we've been doing this for 24 years We've done it for Google. We've done it for Emirates. We've done it for Heineken in Holland. We've done it for LG in Korea. Lots of different, you know, Mahindra in India, lots of different companies. 
We've been working with uh, Afterpay, which is an Australian company, uh, or used to be. <laughs> just recently sold. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, once you have a cultural movement, you can do anything in the changing media environment. And a cultural movement is, you know, when an idea on the rise inspires mass engagement by the culture. And, you know, the way you get going is first you have to kind of, def- you know, the strategy has to define the change you want to make. You know, this includes what kind of behavior you want your customers to have in relationship with the company or what kind of social change you want to drive. And it has to be relevant to your business, as I said. And then the second thing you need to do is you really have to understand your target. Why do they behave as they do? What's important to them in the category that within you work, but also in their lives? You know, what are the fundamental human truths that you need to identify? And then equally important as understanding your target, you have to understand the culture. What's going on in the world? What's happening in society that's relevant to the purpose, to this idea that we're trying to launch as a movement. Um, And then, you know, understanding that people want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And that's kind of what we're designing for, right? That's the framework we have. Of course, this strategy has to serve the benefit of the company, you know, drive like with Jim Beam, drive share harder or, um, you know, ultimately serve the equity, the, you know, benefit the equity of the company in some way. Um, but to begin the movement, uh, you really need to, uh, we start with your own people. So you start with the employees and then you uh, also um, try to provoke a discussion. You know, the biggest challenge you're trying to overcome is complacency. And this requires you to kind of turn deep human insights into sharp instigation, you know, something that galvanizes people. If you're not galvanizing people, then whatever you're doing is not working. And companies are full of communication that employees never read, you know, or just they line the walls of all lunchrooms. No one ever cares about that stuff. Um, then you want to build a community space where people can gather. Typically that's a digital place, but it can also be a physical place. You know, think of it as your sort of movement hub where ideas are shared, people come together, communities built. Then you want to develop your own must-share content, storytelling, language. You know, the more that you can create the whole your own buzzwords and phrases, the more they're adopted by people. And then you want to have influencers and opinion formers involved so they can get great content out or at least help share your content with others. You need to have the opportunity to uh, launch some kind of an action, Um, something that uh, people will disproportionately be receptive to, you know, that really lives up to the movement that you're trying to to bring to life. And once you've done that action or a couple of actions, then you can start amplifying that to a wider audience. Um, And you can do that through social media. You can do that through paid advertising. You can do that through all sorts of different mechanisms, digital tools as well. And then, you know, social media uh, becomes like the oxygen. Uh, It becomes your cultural oxygen. So social is very important, both uh, as a tool for consumers, but also for employees. Employees get their, uh, their cues from social media of their colleagues. They don't actually get it from internal communications anymore. So you've got to use social even to reach your employees. Um, And then you're nurturing that movement in real time. So you're able to uh, watching where sparks start and engaging with the conversation. So the fire keeps burning. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And thank you for that breakdown. That was a fantastic breakdown. What I was going to ask then is, I I could be wrong here. I probably am wrong, but it's, it seems to be that, you know, this tends to be targeted more for consumer companies, you know, that have like uh, quite a large audience that can kind of, create a movement. So, so my first question, is that true? Or can kind of, you know, the smaller kind of, you know, more like niche kind of organizations that don't have, you know, such a big audience, can they still have a brand purpose like, and a movement? Or is that kind of like overkill because of the, like the, the amount of actions that have to happen, you know, because that kind of outline seems like a lot of, of time and resources for, kind of helping the world, 
but also for upside potential to the company. So it would seem that the movements would have to be quite large to get that uptake. So like, is there a certain size organization, certain kind of um, like type of organization that this would be more suited to? So um, that observation is not accurate. So any thank company- you for that. that cause, cause this <laughs> is what I wanted to put stuff out because yeah. there's going to be people thinking about it, including no. myself. Right. Um, I'm like, well, I do like B2B is this the same or I do that. B2B works. The same? Now B2B works for sure. I mean, I'll give you an example. We, so we worked with a company called uh, uh, Rexo. It's a f- Swedish pharmaceutical company that wanted to enter the U S market and they make something called um, it's like a mat medically assisted treatment. It's, it's medication that uh, people that are addicted to opioids take to try to get off uh, opioids. Uh, it's a, me- it's a um, medicine you take. Uh, if you've never been on opioids, you won't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, it's a company that came to the U.S. They wanted to launch here and it was a B2B problem they had. They wanted to sell their product to um, doctors so they would prescribe the medication and other buying groups for medical organizations. Um, And there's a major, uh, 80% of the market is run by one company called Subsalt. They make something called Suboxo, which is a, you know, 80% of the market is that product. And these guys were coming in with a better, or uses of the product was was better. So it would use less of the medical medicine to solve the problem. So it was good because you don't want to take too much of this medication anyway. So, you know, how do you come into a market? 80%, you have a, you have a, this massive uh, existing company that runs the market. 80% is this company. Plus you have a market that nobody really wants to engage in. So their position's pretty secure. So what we did was we, we said this opioid epidemic in America, nobody wants to talk about which is true. And the reason they don't want to talk about it is because it's accidental opioid addiction. It's doctor prescribed pharmaceutical pers- driven, right? You're all now, of course, everyone's aware of it, but five years ago, nobody talked about it. No articles exist in the magazines and newspapers, TV, no one talked about it. And yet, you know, there was a jumbo jet of people falling out of the sky every month people dying every month, 500, 700 people dying because of this accidental opioid addiction. I'm not talking about choice, not people that choose to be heroin addicts. I'm talking about Johnny who plays cricket, falls down, breaks his leg, goes to the doctor and is given um, uh, oxycodone. I don't know what brands you have in in Australia, but Mm -hmm. you know, Percocet or something like that. And 25% of patients are immediately addicted to the medication, 25%. And of that 25%, 5% become heroin addicts because they can't, it's just because their chemistry makes them immediately addicted. It's very, very hard to get off of it. So what we did was we created a movement called Out the Monster. And the monster was accidental opioid addiction. It was about this whole issue of doctor prescribed opioid addiction. And we, we launched that movement in America. It completely blew the market upside down. It made this new company coming into the market. Not only they were small, but it made them immediately the thought leader. It, they became the place of authority. They challenged the status quo of, of, the, of the sector. They started building momentum with the doctors. And it was a classic case of how you usurp the established leader in the category. And we did all that through movement, driving positive change. So that was a B2B campaign. And, you know, the cost of that program was um, as much as would it cost to do a traditional B2B marketing campaign. It wasn't more expensive. It's just a different framework. Mm. So I uh, thank you for that story because that kind of helped um, uh, to understand the concept a bit more. With this, the movement thinking approach, it is still talking to the consumer. It's impacting the B2B side of things potentially or the consumer side of things, right? Like it's more just starting a conversation across the people that matter within the industry or the people which you're trying to help. And then 
Um, no, no, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be the consumer. It doesn't. You can engage the consumer, but it doesn't have to be the consumer. So I'll give you another example. We did a movement for a company called Cap Gemini. It's a big tech consulting company in Paris. They're global. And years ago, they acquired Ernst and Young's tech um, uh, tech uh, consultancy. So they merged the two. So it was called CGEY for a period of time. And we did that merger. And uh, Capgemini is this huge company. They do everything like outsourcing. They do, di- they do technology consulting. Uh, they, they're, they're very highly regarded uh, consulting company. And we said, well, we did some research. The leadership said to us, you know, we've done this new acquisition. We really want to get out there and tell the world what we do. And we went out and we spoke to buyers of Capgemini services, i.e. C-suite leaders of big companies. And they said to us, we went in there, we put brochures on the table and we said, hey, you want to know what Capgemini does? And they're like, we don't have time. We don't, we don't want to read brochures about what they do. And then we said, all right, that's fair enough, which they don't. Like, which CEO has time to spend reading a brochure about a company that does you know, tech consulting? So then we said, okay, uh, we have three photographs here. One picture was of super sharp looking young Harvard grads. In fact, it was a picture of Harvard. The next was a picture of guys who look like lawyers, quite boring looking. And the third room picture was a room of broken furniture. So we asked these people, which of these is Accenture? Which of these is McKinsey? And which of these pictures is Capgemini? And everybody pointed to the Accenture guys as the Harvard guys. And everybody pointed Capgemini as the broken furniture. So we went back to the leadership. We had all this on video. And we said, your issue isn't that people don't understand what you do. The issue is you're irrelevant. You've got to be relevant. So we created a movement called Defy the Economy. We took all their products and we put it into a packaging called the Adaptive Enterprise. So we said, if you buy the services of Capgemini, you become an adaptive enterprise. Our product is called the Adaptive Enterprise. Your organization becomes the adapt- becomes adaptive. And, in or- and that means you are part of the movement to defy the economy because the economy is a bit like a manic depressive. It's <laughs> one day is up, the next day is down. You can't really predict what the economy is going to do. So don't spend time trying to predict it because you can't. Instead, you've got to be able to get out there and become an adaptive organization. And that was a pure B2B play. No consumers involved. But we, you know, I guess you could say it's consumer language, consumer sentiment, consumer mentality. You know, IBM for years said they always tried to bring the consumer mindset to their marketing, even though it was B2B, and they did a pretty good job. Um, most B2B companies are doing a horrible job. They try to be boring on purpose. And, and buyers of considered purchase equipment or services, they don't want boring partners. They want partners that can make them feel excited. They want partners that make them feel like they understand where the world's going. Mm. And more importantly, can break through the wall of indifference. What I like about this conversation is all your examples are so like different in terms of the movement, but they're all the same kind of thinking. So it's really stretching my mind in terms of, you know, so what is a movement? And if we're stretching, if we're stretching my mind, I'm sure it's stretching the mind of the listeners too, that kind of potentially aren't across this kind of thinking, right? So it does yeah. seem that it, it should be linked in some way to what you do, right? That's, is that a fair yeah. saying? Cool. That's a fair statement. It should position you in some way that can make you stand out from the competition. What are you doing that noise. nobody else is doing? That's the question, right? Yeah. What do you, and then it should be bold enough that it can help to galvanize your staff plus the market, right? You know, yeah, because, get some conversation started. Yeah, because it's got to it's got to do two simple things. It's got to increase the willingness for people to work for your company, and it's got to increase the willingness of people to buy from your company. That's all it's doing. And what's interesting is that you know I think when people think of brand purpose and movement thinking, they think of Patagonia, they don't think of the adaptive enterprise, right? And that adaptive enterprise, that is still a movement, right? Now, trying to find the movement that talks to your organization, 
that seems to be really, really quite challenging, right? Because you've got to pick something which you care about. Then you have to pick something which is a real challenge, like the, the, a challenge like in the world, like in the industry or whatever. And then yeah. you have to create them like the frameworks internally and the message externally to communicate it. And then you have to keep investing in it for a long enough time. Is that right? Like, like in a kind of like nutshell, I'm still trying to just confirm that I get it. Right. So, so if it's wrong, no, I think that's right. That's right. It's right. I mean, it can evolve over time. Like for example, you know, we did a purpose for Pampers, you know, the diaper Yep. before we worked with them, basically they were the best engineered poop catcher and we created a purpose called baby development. And baby development changed the game for Pampers because it gave them a really relevant idea that they could define their reason for being, but also create new types of products, new types of services that parents need. And that could include also um, communities of parents, tools that parents could use to become better parents. And, you know, as a result, they transformed their business. They were they were behind the market leader here in the US called Huggies. I ended up usurping them. We ended up launching in China. We we did uh, you know Eastern Europe and Western Europe, um, and so that simple idea of baby development is completely relevant to Pampers, of course. Um, and you know during the that um, that program, uh, the movement, we we launched a product that was two times thinner, uh, two times you know that's classic P and G, two times thinner, two times drier. Uh, it's called the, the new diaper was a feat of engineering, really quite extraordinary. But what we did was we positioned it as a um, uh, performance enhancing diaper, like, a, like, you know, your Australians are so good at um, the Olympic swimming. Mm. So like they wear that sleek glide enhancing uh, textile. That's like what happens when you wear Pampers. Uh, with Drymax, this new product that we launched. And we connected it back to baby development, which was the fact that it's thinner allows the baby to move freely and that stimulates the brain, which is part of baby development. So everything we do is in the service of driving a better form of baby development. And it just helped the company focus and grow globally. And that's kind of it. Like it's, it's that and then activating it you know, we did, for example, with Pampers, we, I went to the leadership and I said, you know, you, you advertise to mothers after they've given birth because P&G as a company never spends a dollar advertising to non-customers. So by virtue, a non-customer is a prenatal mom. However, prenatal moms are truth seekers. The minute parents find out they're pregnant, they're scouring the internet for anything they can get their hands on which is when you want to be out there. So I came up, we came up with a strategy called capture at conception, which was all about building tools and utilities out there that once you become pregnant, you can actually find Pampers and you, we build a relationship. Cause if you start building the relationship nine months out, they're going to stick with you longer. And one of the biggest business problems that Pampers had at the time was parents, they start off using Pampers because it's um insecure. And then after about a year, they go, you know, I'm actually pretty good at this. I don't need Pampers anymore. And they switch to a cheaper diaper. You can use the cheaper diaper from the beginning, but Pampers has created this mindset that if you don't buy Pampers, you're a terrible parent. So nobody dares until they build enough courage after a year and realize that Pampers actually is great, but there are other great ones out there too. Mm. Um, so we were able through capturing conception to actually lengthen the time that parents use the product. So you mentioned before that the cost of something like this, like, isn't like, like it can be similar to any kind of campaign that you launch, which means that it's really the thinking, it's the messaging, it's kind of like how you talk about the brand now, it's how you integrate it like into what you're already doing. So it doesn't like, it seems um, in hearing this conversation that this is a very expensive process, right? But 
from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't have to be, it can be, of course, but, but it doesn't have to be, it can just be kind of how you change, how you talk about yourself and how you change kind of the, the messages that you put out uh, to the marketplace. Is that correct? Well, it's not just how you put it out in the marketplace. It's your actions that are driving some form of positive change. You know, it, it would be like, I was looking at something from Australia. There's a guy I know his name is Brent. He's the CMO of a company in Australia, uh, a big insurance company. And he came out with a program called um, NRMA insurance. Yeah. NRMA insurance. Yep. Yeah. I think he's the CMO of that company. And he did this movement and it was all about, um, it's called a fire inside. There's a fire inside all of us, a burning desire to help. And it was an amazing program, uh, a significant project, including a feature length documentary and book to create a national movement in part partnership with the Mindaroo Foundation to mobilize Australia's largest contingency of volunteers to prepare and protect Australia from future natural disasters. That's a really great example of a movement. Like here's an insurance company that, you know, is saying, look, there's a fires coming every year. It's not going away. We're going to need a new way of thinking. We want to drive that conversation in society. And we're going to bring lots of people together who otherwise wouldn't be connected, but have a personal stake in seeing this succeed. And that's basically, and by doing so, by virtue of being the ones crystallizing this movement, that organization, the NRMA or insurance group, are going to be generating a lot of fans and a lot of positive feedback from their employees. They're going to walk taller. Their families are going to love them more. The CEO's children is going to know and appreciate what their father or mother is doing because most children of CEOs don't know what their parents do. (laughs) (laughs) All the positive things in life. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so thank you for clarifying that, but on, um, the, the like investment side of things, right. It doesn't have to cost significantly, you know, like, like it doesn't have to be large. It, the intention and the action kind of have to be completely aligned. Right. And so you don't need to spend significant amounts of money to have, or to create the brand purpose and to maybe activate it. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. That's right. And so what do you need that is critical to make this successful? I think you need an idea that's going to be relevant to your people and that they're passionate about. And then you need to crystallize it in a way that feels it's original and different. And I haven't heard it before. And then you need to activate it in a way that really, you know, makes uh, an impression, a positive impression. And, and people feel like it's credible. And then you need to continue to do that. Um, and it's a bit like, uh, you know, a tornado, what that is, Mm -hmm. you know, what that is a tornado. Yeah. Yeah. It's, if you think about traditional advertising, it's kind of very linear. You kind of, you shoot a message out there, you pay money to run an ad. And when you stop paying for it, it kind of just stops. Awareness drops. No one remembers, but a movement is a bit like a tornado. It's like got built in sustainability. If you kind of push it every once in a while, It's constantly churning. It's constantly building energy up because the energy is coming from the people. It's not a fake idea that you're creating, doing a really great creative ad and pushing it out there, which is in effect manipulation. This is what people already care about. You're simply crystallizing energy that's already in the world and you're connecting it back to your organization in a credible way. That's that's what this is. It's, it's just, you're not making it up. It's existing. Your organization, your people already care about it. They just haven't been able to understand because you haven't articulated it very well. You know, if you go back, it's funny when I talk to CEOs, I ask them like, you know, this idea, is it, is it so new? And they're, most of them are like, you know, not really. We actually did this a few years ago, but it wasn't so clear. It wasn't so well done. We didn't ask people to be part of it. We didn't ask them for their ideas. We didn't ask them to help drive this or, you know, to help spread it among our people. So I think the tactics are really important. You know, how you frame it, how you crystallize it. 
that that's really how you make a movement. Uh, is there a certain size organization um, that is required before they start thinking of this kind of approach, I, I, except for the ones that kind of have the movement kind of like, um, uh, like built into the product, the companies that have like a, uh, the product or service, and then they're trying to create a movement. So for those types of companies, like, is there a certain size that they should be before they start even considering this? No, you can do it from scratch. You can be a startup uh, and do it. You don't have to be a, a company that, um, you know, is a billion dollar company. In fact, I would argue that the best, the companies that are best um, at this are startups. You know, um, I think that's the, I mean, the biggest opportunity uh, today, I think, is to be solving world problems. You know, you're more likely to create a successful uh, long term business if you're not just creating a company that makes money, but you're actually trying to solve real world problems. You know, there's some great examples out there of companies that do that. Okay. That's great. And so it can be done from the startup stage. And if you've got your purpose kind of um, like baked into the personality of the company from the first day, that certainly will make it easier to, to attract people that think the same way and to attract clients that think the same way as well. And, to kind of the care about the same issues as you. Is that right? So yeah, and that's absolutely. the core yeah. part of it. Yeah. Movement thinking, like we said in the book, activate brand purpose, movement thinking has changed behavior and minds for generations. And now it's time for startups to apply this to the core of their business to drive tangible change. Mm. And, you know, entrepreneurs will be rewarded, you know, for it. The world's full of problems to be solved. And, you know, each one of those represents an immense opportunity for startups. Why focus on an idea the world doesn't need when you, you know, there's great business to be had in solving real world problems. And there's a company actually owned by an Australian guy who lives in the U.S. called High Bar. Um, and he addressed the issue of plastic pollution uh, and created a movement. Um, and it's basically a shampoo that comes as a bar, like a soap bar, but it's high quality like uh, salon quality shampoo, but comes in the, like a brick and you use it in your hair. So there's no plastic, zero plastic and, you know, clean ingredients, high performance, and they're just killing it here in the U S and they started the company to do away with plastic because mm. people are fed up with plastic in the oceans as you, you know, and eliminate single use plastic. So, you know, people, especially younger generation these days, are really um, passionate about it. There's another company from Paris, another startup that I was part of called uh, Courbet, C-O-U-R-B-E-T. Uh, that is the world's first man-made diamond jewelry brand that uses repurposed gold. So the diamonds are made in labs, not blood diamonds. So they don't destroy the you know, earth. They don't, they don't have slaves make, you know, digging it up for nothing. Um, this is lab grown and um, it's super hot right now uh, among French millennials, young kids, youngers uh, who, you know, you can't be beautiful uh, unless you do good. Mm. That's kind of the philosophy of, of Courbet. If you go to Courbet.fr, you'll see what I'm talking about. And that's a really appealing idea to a lot of young people these days. Why should I buy a blood diamond? when I can buy diamond that, by the way, is, is a currency. Diamonds are currency, right? Like gold, like platinum, like titanium. So it's a man-made diamond or a human-made diamond or uh, a blood diamond. They're the value is the same. In fact, once you cut a lab diamond, you can't even tell that it's a lab diamond. Mm. Um, so if you want to buy your fiance something amazing, and save the world in the process, look at Courbet. That's the main point. Like, do business, but try to drive some form of positive change in the process. Yeah, sure. And I think, you know, and this has been such a fantastic conversation. I think it's really kind of understanding, you know, so what the company stands for, you know, so what is a problem in the world um, that needs to be solved? Like, and what is that company prepared to, 
to do um, to follow that movement through. Is that right? Yeah, That's exactly. the thinking behind it. Now, yeah. this is the kind of work which you do at Strawberry Frog. Um, so just for the listeners and the viewers, ask what kind of companies, so what kind of organizations uh, does Strawberry Frog actually help and how do they get in touch with you? First of all, if you want to find out the answer to those questions, you can email Megan at strawberryfrog.com. She um, interacts with people that want to find out whether we can help them. Uh, Megan at strawberryfrog.com. Uh, I would say, you know, my personal objective is to um, make the biggest impact as possible. So large organizations are great, but I also like working with with startups that have that are well funded and want to do something genuinely positive before the cataclysm comes. <laughs> something <laughs> positive, yeah, uh, that would be great. Yeah, you know, with a really cool product that excites us would be great. Um, so. I would say both of those types of firms and even companies, you know, if you're a leader and you're listening to this and you're like, well, you know, we make widgets and God, we're really boring. (laughs) Well, no, you might have something really valuable to say or Mm. do Mm. in this world. I mean, there's a lot of big issues we're dealing with right now, right? There's mental health, there's financial issues, there's issues that have to do with the community, the local community, as well as the global community. There's issues about, about education and there's issues about toxic food. I mean, there's so many issues out there, honestly, um, that regardless of what you do, there's ways that you can drive some sort of positive change as well. That's great. And, um, and just for the listeners, so for the people who like this conversation, you've got to check out his book. It's called Activate Brand Purpose. Um, it's not too long. So like it's kind of quick and punchy and we'll just kind of explain exactly what you need to do and it's such a good it's such a good idea for all companies to consider because if you can link the success of your company to actually helping the world you know what better um like initiative is that you know and so look scott thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking through the the ideas of the brand purpose the movement thinking kind of ideas these are extremely contemporary right now and there's a lot of organizations that are thinking about this but they're not quite sure the place to start. And so thank you so much for explaining this. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, this is, I'm passionate about this and we definitely need to, all of us need to try to do something to make, you know, these problems at least uh, emphatic as they are. And, you know, I mean, there's so many issues now with, with um, quality and inclusion and issues around sustainability. I mean, there's just so many issues out there. There's issues coming out of COVID. People are, I've been through such difficult times, communities, employees. So um, for me, it's a personal uh, commitment, something that I'm really passionate about. I've been doing for 30 years. Um, And, you know, we did, and by the way, the book is great, but if you really want a great experience, check it out on Audible because the Audible, we have this guy who's read it and he does all the New Yorker readings if you ever listen to new yorker magazine mm. so it just sounds so amazing like the book is well written but when he reads it it's like 10 times more <laughs> so try that one too <laughs> well i definitely get it after this i mean like i bought the book and i normally like audible um but yeah like i'll check out the book as well because now i'm really interested um great. scott thank you so much for coming on the podcast um and we'll talk Pleasure. soon have a great day thank you for inviting me on love it fantastic thanks for listening to the growth manifesto podcast If you enjoyed the episode, please give us a five-star rating on iTunes. For more episodes, please visit growthmanifesto.com forward slash podcast. And if you need help driving growth for your company, please get in touch with us at webprofits.io.